information session, and we are excited to have you here. And my name is Dianetta Jones Creighton. I'm director of the Office of Minority Education, and I'm also an associate dean in the Office of the Vice Chancellor. So our team is here today to tell you as much information as we can in this short amount of time about the office uh, that we run and all of the services that we provide. So just a few housekeeping things to make note of. It's good to see all of you. If you wanna show your faces, that's great. And if you don't, that's fine too. But I'm loving seeing all of your names and faces pop up. It's really, really exciting to see all of you. Um, welcome, welcome to MIT and congratulations to all of you on being admitted to MIT. We really hope that you will join us um, in the official fall semester, whenever that kicks off. Uh, but we wanna tell you about who we are and what we do. So Samia, I have connected the recording, so please make sure that's true, because uh, we wanna make sure we're recording this so that we can show this um, at other times for other students who may not be able to join us today. So again, my name is Dianetta Jones Creighton, and I'm the Director of the Office of Minority Education. I want to say thank you for joining us. I'm especially grateful that you're joining us, especially given everything that's happening in the world today, the fact that you are still uh, here and that you're focused on uh, what you're going to do next with your college experience uh, makes us really happy. We hope that your families are safe and healthy and well and that you're taking care of yourselves as you navigate the rest of your high school experience right now and that you're still excited about your college experience. I want to say upfront that MIT hopes that you would choose us Choose us, choose us. And we want you to choose us not because MIT is so great. Um, of course, we believe we're great and we hope that you, mm. Can you hear me now? Wonderful. So if something, uh, choppy happens with the audio, just somebody just wave their fingers so I'll know to check it. Um, but for some reason, the audio has gone out a little bit for the first time on this call. All day has been great. So thank you for your patience. So what I was saying was, um, we hope that you will select MIT not because MIT is so great. Uh, we think we're great. We think we have uh, great opportunities, great experience, great faculty, great staff, and we hope that you see that and you hear that and you feel that as you go through the CPW sessions. But the reason why we really hope you select us is because you're great. You are phenomenal. Uh, your applications are amazing and you have options that are beyond MIT and we know that. And so if you choose us, then you help MIT to become better and you help us to make a better world. And so that's why we want you to come here because we know that what you have to offer is going to help us become better so that we can do more to, to help the world be a better place. And so the OME has a job to play in that. And MIT is a rigorous place, it's a challenging place, but it's also this fun and exciting and innovative place. And we help you figure out all of that while you're here, starting even before you come to MIT and all the way through your time um, all the way to you become a graduate of MIT. And so that's what we're going to do today, go over the programs and services that our office has. Now, while you're going through the session, uh, we're not going to take uh, questions during the actual session, although you can put them into the chat. Uh, we have team members who are monitoring the chat and they will answer questions directly and they will also bring those questions to our attention so that we can answer those publicly as well. So what's going to happen is there will be three different segments, one on the OME, which uh, will take about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll do a brief Q&A. Then you'll have another session on a program that we, are, we want you to hear about called the standard, and then we'll have a brief, brief Q&A after that, and then you'll hear about Interface Edge, and then we'll have another Q&A. So there'll be times for you to ask questions and for us to address questions, but just not during the actual presentation. So again, remember to keep um, your, uh, your audio on mute. So I'm going to share my screen right now so that we can start the official presentation. I'm hoping that all of you can hear me and all is well. So this is the Office of Minority Education's official information session where we hope to tell you everything that we can that will continue to empower your success while you're here at MIT. 
So the first thing we want to show you is a brief video so that you can hear the student voice. Place like MIT, you have people all over the world from different backgrounds, different cities, and different cultures. And the OME is a place where you can find people that probably have your same background. In my case, there's one of the staff members who's Puerto Rican, so that's always nice when you go in and talk to her. They're open arms, no matter who you are, where you're from. At the core of this mission to make the world a better place is empowering students with that mindset, with that mind at hand mindset, and giving them the tools that they need in order to be effective in that mission. And the OME plays a distinct role in that in making sure that these students are successful. For many students, they find within the OME that this is the community that becomes sort of their home. We have a portfolio of about 25 different programs that really do help students navigate MIT, but also think about what they want to do beyond MIT. We have a number of corporate sponsors and supporters that come in and talk to students about resume writing, dressing for success, and sort of being able to navigate the job and internship opportunities. I'm Grace Tan Wong, NASA JPL. I am on the university programs team here at Google Cambridge. I think that's really valuable. I think it's special that those companies come specifically for their own me and to like see underrepresented minorities. Minorities. Success and success is the only has given it to me. It's all my confidence and feeling like you understand your environment. Like so I got some text. So, so we make sure that we send the video link uh, to the students. I think we can put that in there right now. Um, and I'm also going to try to show it again at the end because I think I know what was happening with the sound. So we'll try to fix that. But it's a very cool video clip and I want you to have a chance to, um, to experience it in a real way. So I want to just tell you a little bit more about our team. So this is the slide that shows you our team. This is the OME uh, team that makes the magic happen. We have uh, assistant deans in the office, several of whom you're going to hear from today. We also have folks who you probably have received emails from already, like Cheryl Motley. You probably already received an email from her. She's our receptionist and she really stays, helps students stay connected to our team. And then we also have uh, three program assistants who help us to run our programs. And my staff assistant, my administrative assistant is Fatima Smith. So all of these folks are really uh, connected to the OME in the sense that they care about students and they care about your success and they are very passionate about the work. This slide basically just shares the mission and vision of the OME, and it's really important too because not only is the OME an academic office, a professional de development office, a community building office, we are also an office that wants you to excel. You know, we want you to be happy. We want you to explore all of the opportunities that MIT has to offer and more. And so our office is an office that really is about helping students achieve their passions. This slide is uh, uh, the portfolio of OME programs and services, and not even all of them. The, the programs that are in red are the ones that really do stand out for first year students. And so those are the ones you're going to hear about today um, in the presentation that we're doing right now. And then you'll have some in-depth time to talk about Interface Edge and the standard. But what you can see here is, is the takeaway I want you to have is there are programs that focus on professional development, there are programs that support your academic excellence, and there are services and programs that support community building, your wellness, your sense of belonging, networking, and advocacy, connecting you to industry, connecting you to faculty inside and outside of the classroom, connecting you to alumni, and connecting you to your peers. This is um, alphabet soup. Um, acronym soup is probably better for MIT. You will learn that MIT is this very, very uh, much acronym friendly place. So all of these are student organizations. Uh, the first one you see there, that acronym stands for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. Uh, some of you might recognize the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, which is down at the bottom on the right there, my right. And then some of you may not uh, recognize some of the acronyms. For instance, BWA. That's the Black Women's Alliance, and BSU is the Black Students' Union, and LCC is Latino Cultural Center, and La Casa is a living group in, um, in Newhouse, and Chocolate City is a living group in Newhouse. So all of these organizations um, 
have an opportunity for you to find your space, find your people. Some of them are discipline focused. They're focused on a particular STEM discipline. Some of them are just culturally based or gender focused um, and they have a, a heart for serving the greater student population. We also have faculty who are on, on what we call our faculty advisory committee. And these are faculty in departments all across the Institute that are very focused on equity and inclusion and diversity. And they work with the OME monthly to support our initiatives. They serve as liaisons to the departments and they are very strong advocates for the OME and the students we serve. We also have a host of industry partners. Uh, these industry partners are invested not only in the OME, um, but they're invested in the students. They spend time on campus. They make time to help students in resume building and interviewing skills and finding internship opportunities and finding scholarship opportunities. And there are over 20 or so different organizations that come here specifically to work with us so that they can recruit talented, diverse students. And so in that group are industry representatives who have an MIT affiliation, um, but also industry representatives who may not be. So you can see some of those companies there, many of which you will learn about even as early as the summer because they are interested in connecting with you. So next, um, we will, you will hear from one of our assistant deans, uh, Dean Lilena Uchima, and she'll tell you about two of our programs, Seminar Excel, Seminar Excel LE, and also the TSR Square. Lilen? Thank you, Dean Creighton. Can everyone hear me? Loud and clear? Yes. Awesome. Hola, everyone. Um, as Dean Creighton mentioned, my name is Lilen Uchima, and I am going to discuss a little bit two of our academic excellence programs starting with Seminar Excel and Seminar Excel LE. So Seminar Excel is a structure facilitator small study group um, for a small number of students, so three to seven students each. And these courses are taken alongside the science, math, and engineering GIRs, which are the general institute requirements, uh, which are calculus, physics, chemistry, and biology. We do have other popular courses, uh, typically the introductory courses into popular majors, such as intro to coding, for instance, and those might be available as well. Um, so the classes meet twice a week for 90 minutes each, um, and they are facilitated by upper class uh, students and also graduate students. And so the idea is um, that from this structure um, study group, you're gonna be able to master those core subjects, um, sharpen your problem solving skills, develop uh, effective study habits, but also teamwork strategies to solve problems. Um, so we do try to uh, put together the groups in a way that is comfortable for everyone's level of understanding, but oftentimes we, give exposure to additional concepts and materials from those classes and also even uh, more challenging uh, problems to solve. So it really puts you in a good position to go into the class and really learn how to problem solve and really understand the core concepts. Um, so first year students can receive credit if they take Seminar Excel because Seminar Excel is actually a class at MIT. And so first year students can earn up to three units of credit per Seminar Excel class that they take. And one cool thing about Seminar Excel is that it's very flexible. So you can actually add a Seminar Excel class even after um, uh, the start of ad day, which is typically about a month or a little bit more than a month into the semester. So these classes are called Seminar Excel LE or limited edition. And first year students um, can add them after ad day and also they can earn up to one unit of credit per Seminar Excel LE class that they take. Um, so for the fall, Seminar Excel is actually one of the exceptions to the credit limit rule. And so first year student can actually exceed the credit limit in the fall only up to 60 units if they take a Seminar Excel class. So that is Seminar Excel. Uh, now I'm going to talk about um, our other academic excellent program, the Talented Scholars Resource Room or TSR Square, as we like to call it. So the TSR Square, as you can see from the pictures, is actually a study lounge. It's located in Building 16. Um, and it's a place where students can go. It's a card access um, room, so students can go there. It's open every day, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Students can go there to lounge in between classes. We have a microwave, so heat your uh, lunch up. We have uh, water coolers to get water. Um, but also, 
you can get free academic services in the, in the TSR Square. So we offer three of those. Uh, the first ones we call PSET nights. Uh, PSETs are basically problem sets, which are kind of like a longer homework that um, most classes at MIT give out. And these happen weekly. So we have, for instance, a weekly physics PSET night every Monday night from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And that will happen throughout the semester. Um, and students can come in and uh, drop in anytime from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. and get help in their problem sets or any other concepts that they need help in. Uh, we also offer one-on-one -on -one app appointments. So these are one-hour uh, free academic appointments with our TSR Square facilitators, and they can be easily booked through our OME website. And last but not least, we also offer exam reviews, uh, typically for the GIRs, for the General Institute requirements, and these happen 24 to 48 to 24 hours in advance of the exam and throughout the semester. So as I mentioned, all services are free and are open to all undergraduates uh, at MIT. Um, and again, the TSR is open every day for students 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And next. So I will take it from here. Hi, everyone. My name is Devin Monroe. I am another assistant dean in the office. Looks like something has happened to our slides. So give us just a moment. Yeah, I'm going to. So I'm going to, something kicked us out of the, the share and screen, so I'm going to try that again. So Devin, you should be all set. Let me just, um, sh oh, I didn't mean to do that, actually. Hold tight, everyone. Devin, all set. Great. Thank you, Dianetta. So as I mentioned, my name is Devin Monroe. I'm another assistant dean in the office, and I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the Mentor Advocate Partnership Program, also known as MAP. So MAP is an opt-in program exclusively for first-year students, um, and it's really designed to help students transition into MIT, um, because MIT is um, a very interesting and unique place um, that can be very complex. Um, so we have uh, faculty, staff, postdocs, and grad students who all sign up to serve as mentors uh, to all of you. Um, it's important to note that mentors do not replace your academic advisor, but rather they're there to help guide you through your first year, refer you to resources at MIT, refer you to other things that are going on within the Boston area, and just help you get acclimated to the new academic atmosphere that you're in. And for sophomore year and beyond, we have an, another program called EMAP, which is our E-Mentor Advocate Partnership Program. And that program is really more professional development focused in which we connect you with MIT alumni and or affiliates with our industry partners. And there, those mentors help you um, connect electronically um, in, and they engage in different um, professional development related topics. They review your resume, they do mock interviews with you, um, engage in general career discussions. Um, so this is a great way to really connect uh, with someone on campus right away. And if you are thinking about um, applying to MAP, uh, we will send information about the application that will open in mid-August. Next slide, please. Great. The other program that I would like to mention is Momentum. So Momentum is an actual class that takes place over IEP, which is the January term, and students who enroll uh, receive six units of elective credit. So the class is open to both first years and second year students, um, and any uh, major or academic interest is welcome. So uh, Momentum students are paired into teams, um, and the real goal is that you would prototype a solution to a real world problem that's 
um, that's posed by our industry partners. And then you present those solutions to a panel of judges who are also affiliated with our networking, um, our network of industry partners. The really uh, awesome opportunity uh, for Momentum is that we also have a mixer in which you get to connect with those partners uh, more intimately. And also um, several of the partners do select students to interview for possible summer internship opportunities. So we do receive uh, a lot of internship offers for our first year students. So it's a great way um, to not only start connecting with industry representatives uh, soon in your MIT career, um, but also potentially receive an internship uh, the summer of your after your first year. We are working out the details of uh, what Momentum 2021 will look like, um, and we're hoping to have that information ready to share in September. Uh, but just as a quick recap of what we did this past January, we actually had two uh, separate tracks that students could enroll in. Uh, one was with General Motors, and we asked the students to develop novel devices to assist users with physical, visual, or auditory impairments uh, to fully utilize autonomous vehicles. And then we had a second track with Capital One in which we had asked the student teams to develop a product to empower financial security for un and underbanked populations, which I think uh, now more than ever um, is a very pertinent topic. Um, so these topics are also very timely. Um, and as I mentioned, they do look to engage in real world problems. All right, so that's the official presentation and I'm going to actually stop sharing the screen and come back so that we can take some questions. So, uh, you've been monitoring the chat, the chat, and I don't know if there's some specific questions that came through the chat, but we are now open for Any questions? Um, hi. Um, my name is Jorge, um, and I had some questions about the Interface, interface Edge program, because they emailed me about it um, a few months ago, and um, I know some general things about it, but now, because of the whole quarantine situation, um, I know there was um, a part in which we were going to have to go to MIT for like seven weeks, and I'm wondering if that's still going to happen, or, if, or do we have to apply for the online version of that, or how, how is it going to work now? So can I just answer that question really quickly and tell you that you're going to have a whole segment on interface coming up very shortly. So the, the, yes, yes, very shortly. So hold tight, because you're probably not the only one, Jorge, who has that question. And so Samia Kalu is going to talk about interface very shortly. So do not go anywhere. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? I have a question. Oh, sorry. Maybe we should, um, if you uh, can use the raise your hand segment or put your question in the chat. Should I type my question or ask? Oh, you can ask it now, go ahead. Yes, so we're currently, we're still waiting for our financial aid package. We were told that it would come um, last week, but it hasn't yet come. When should we expect to um, receive it, seeing that May 1st is the, um, is the date is the date to make it to either to make a decision so um i actually don't know the specific answer to that but i do know that if you reach out to the student financial services office that you would be able to find out the answer to that and if you send um if you send me an email i can actually request information for you uh, so, Dianetta, there are some questions in the chat. So, can you be a part of Seminar XL or LE in a study in, in a study group at the same time? And in a study group at the same time. Leland, you want to respond? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yes. Uh, so, Seminar XL is meant to be kind of like a study group. Um, in, in the sense that it's small and it's facilitated by, by someone, um, but you earn credits for it if you're a first year student. So you can absolutely be part of Seminar Cell, take a Seminar Cell um, class, and then also be part of a study group, let's say with your friends or with your peers that you live in the, in the dorm. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, absolutely, you can do both. 
And I think there's another seminar cell question um, that I'm just gonna uh, take now. Is there a limit to the amount of students who can take seminar Excel LE? So we do try to keep the study groups at a maximum of seven students. We've we found out that that is a way that everyone is still engaged and they can really get to know each other because the whole point of, of it as well is to get to know other students that are taking the same course and really get to um, practice problem solving with them. So we try to keep it at a maximum, I would say seven students. But what we do do if we have uh, more students that are interested, of course, is that we will have multiple sessions of the same class. So for instance, uh, 802, uh, 801, classical mechanics is very popular in the fall. And so we might have four or five or six groups of seminar Excel for that one class. There are a few more seminar Excel questions. One is, can you do seminar Excel along with ESG and concourse? The other is, um, uh, seminar Excel, does it replace the GIRs? I've, I've responded to that, but you might want to elaborate. Yeah, so sure. So for Seminar Excel, uh, we actually um, can have a Seminar Excel that is specifically designed to fit what um, concourse or ESG or Terrascope classes are teaching. So we've had in the past had, um, for instance, an ESG 802 class for Seminar Excel. So it could really be tailored to that. Um, as long as we have at least three students that are interested in taking that class, we'll try to find a facilitator that has taken that ESG, Terrascope, Conquers course, um, and we'll start a study group. So it can definitely be tailored to fit the, uh, what Conquers Terrascope, the um, communities are teaching. So that's a, a great question. Um, and the other one? Um, what kind of credit? Oh, the replacement, so yeah, so um, Dean Crane uh, answered that one, but the seminars actually do not replace the GIR classes. Um, they, you're, they're meant to be a study group to complement that, um, if you're interested in taking it. Of course, it's an opt-in uh, program. And I see another one that says, what is the difference between the study services offered by Seminar Excel versus TSR Squared? That's a great question. So Seminar Excel are um, study groups, and so they meet uh, twice a week for 90 minutes. Um, regularly is the same set of students with the same uh, facilitator. So it's kind of like a, a study uh, group, but it's in a form of a class. So you get credits for it versus the TSR square is really like a study lounge is a physical space on campus that students can go to uh, to either study or lounge on their own. But we also offer academic services through there. So for instance, um, P the piece at nights that I mentioned that happen weekly. Um, we open the door of the TSR square. So every student can come in and bas basically we will have uh, facilitators sitting on round tables and ready to answer any questions that you might have about that particular topic of the night. So for instance, physics. So every Monday night, 6 p.m., doors are open, students can come in uh, and get help in that particular subject. Um, so the difference is that one is a physical space where we offer services from time to time um, and students can use the space to just lounge and study on their own versus seminar cells an actual class that happens in a classroom and a set number of times this uh, weekly throughout the term. And hopefully that um, answered your question. Um, another one I see here is which category does seminar earn credit for? Um, so this is also um, like an elective credit, basically. Um, Dianetta, there is an initial question that we missed. Uh, the first question is, what are your goals for the upcoming school year for the OME uh, and then the next few years as well? So, um, Isabel, that's a great question. Uh, what we're trying to do right now, as you might imagine, is we're trying to get our bearings around whether or not we'll actually be on campus in the fall um, and the spring for this academic year. And so we are right now trying to figure out uh, how to make sure all of our programs and services are available remotely for up to a semester or up to the next uh, spring semester as well. So that's taking a lot of our attention right now, trying to make sure that the community that we've built, the, the programs and services that we offer, that students don't miss out on those opportunities because um, they may be remote. So that's the priority right now. Our long-term goals, what we do in the OME is we actually assess our programs pretty often. And what we do is we talk to students, we find out what's working and what's not working, and we figure out whether additional initiatives we need to add based on what the students' needs are. 
for example, the Men of Color Initiative that you'll hear about shortly called the Standard, that was added within the last few years as one of our programs because of a specific need that was um, generated from our Men of Color students. We also launched two new first generation low income programs because students who are first generation um, and low income students were, were definitely coming to the OME and asking us for more services that specifically focus on their unique um, situations. And so we've done that. So what the OME does is look at our current programs and see where we need to be and we build programs around that. Right now, our goal is to continue to serve the students at our, uh, the, the, the best we can. Um, a more recent goal, which some of you who are interested in Interface, is to expand the number of students who we serve through Interface. This was the first year that we were able to do that. We moved from 70 students to 90 students, and we're trying to maintain that going forward so that as many students as possible can participate. So I'll pause there, and hopefully that answers Idel's question, but I, um, I think those are the key things I'd like to share. And Devin, there's a question about the number of participants in math, if there's a limited number of spots. So typically we um, have between 35 and 40 students participating in math each year. Um, so we, that tends to be the sweet spot, although there are some years where it's higher um, and some mentors do choose to uh, mentor multiple students. Um, so I would say if you are interested in participating in MAP, definitely submit an application. Um, we, we rarely, if ever, turn students away um, because we know how important it is to uh, make sure there's enough resources to help students transition to MIT. So we will do everything in our power to get you matched up with a mentor. So I, I see some questions in the chat that are going to focus on Interface Edge, and so I'd like to save some of those questions for that presentation. So let us move forward. We're going to hold questions for now um, and go to the next segment, which uh, will take us about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll also spend some time talking specifically about Interface Edge. So all of you will hear that information. Devin? Okay. Um, Samia, can you just verbally confirm that you can see this? Yes, I can see it. So I will be talking about the standard, which um, as Diana mentioned, is our program designed to support the success of our undergraduate men of color. So I'm gonna start off uh, just with a quick testimonial video uh, from one of our first year students who joined the program this past fall. Hi, I am David Spicer. I'm a first year majoring in course 17 or political science. So I decided to join the standard for really two reasons, I would say. One is community. I definitely wanted to find a group of men of color on MIT's campus. Uh, and I think the standard has definitely allowed me to find that group. Uh, and I've enjoyed different things from whether it's having a support group, uh, but also I think just more casually, just a group that to have fun with and participate in different events such as nights out or uh, dinners. My second reason for joining the standard has to be the professional development aspect of the program. I always found it encouraging whenever I receive support from the staff of the standard or also my fellow co cohort members. Uh, and I always found it uplifting to see that I'm kind of working towards my career uh, aspirations alongside other men of color. Uh, yeah, and then I think finally my favorite experience from the standard uh, definitely has to be our fall retreat in the Endicott House. Uh, and I think I just like this from the overall programming, both like the games that we got to participate in, but also learning about different topics that were relevant to men of color. Uh, and yeah, so I think for these reasons, the standard has been a real highlight of my first year and I definitely would recommend it to anyone. So the standard is a cohort-based uh, program designed to support the success of um, academic, personal, and professional of our undergraduate men of color. We launched in um, the spring of 2018, so it is still a relatively new program. And we currently have three cohorts. Uh, so the incoming cohort composed of the first year students who are joining us this fall would be cohort number four. Um, and so the great thing is that the students who are joining join um, in the fall of their first year, and then they stay with us until graduation. So it is truly a community-based, cohort-based program. And we focus on three main components. The first uh, being workshops, skill building, social events. The second is mentoring and community development. And the third is financial resources 
to empower students to achieve their professional development goals. So in terms of the workshops and skill building and social events, uh, we offer eight events per semester. Some of those events are targeted by cohort, um, but others are open to all members. And really the curriculum is designed to be less time intensive in later years. So we know that students might have a little bit more free time as first year students and could possibly attend uh, more sessions to gain those skills um, in their earlier years. And we know that as you, as you get older, your focus is more on finishing up your time at MIT and what you wanna do after you leave and preparing for whatever that might be. So we offer fewer events to older students because we are trying to accommodate um, all the other things that students are participating in and getting ready to prepare for their next step. So some of the events and um, types of things that we do, we always have an induction ceremony to officially welcome our newest cohort into the program. We also offer an annual retreat, which was mentioned in, this, in the testimonial video. And some of the workshops and other events that we, we have each year focus on financial literacy and investing, resume reviews and interview prep, uh, particularly around uh, technical and case interviews, which are very, very common um, for students who are engaging in, in the tech atmosphere. Um, we also hold and engage with, uh, hold lunches and dinners with faculty of color and alumni. Um, and I'll talk more about the alumni connection a little bit later. And on the social side, uh, we try and do fun things each semester as well. So we've gone uh, to play laser tag, we've gone bowling, and we hold game nights as well. So we really try and uh, run uh, our very diverse set of programming to really address the academic, personal, and professional success of our students. Here is a photograph of our uh, newest cohort who were inducted this past October. Um, we always hold an induction ceremony, as I mentioned, every fall. Um, and we, held, we hold it at the MIT Museum, which is a really wonderful, um, beautiful space. Um, we have faculty and staff uh, who come, senior leadership tends to come. We've had the provost attend in the past. Um, so it's a really wonderful formal event to welcome the students to the program. On the mentoring and community development side, um, we, we engage in this in a few different ways. Um, so first, new members are all paired with a peer mentor from an upper cohort. Um, similar to um, in the Greek life system, if you're familiar with the big little system, um, we really develop community uh, both across all members, but also in a more intimate way with a one-on-one -on -one connection um, with someone who can help guide you through your time at MIT. And then once uh, students become sophomores and beyond, um, they are also able to connect with alumni mentors who are men of color uh, via MIT's online Alumni Advisors Hub platform. So we have a pool of, of alumni who have self-selected um, to mentor our young men of color. And so they can go on to this platform and engage in different types of more professional development related topics. So we have students who are connecting with alumni to get their resumes reviewed. We have students who are engaging, particularly, I can think of students who are, who are really interested in pursuing med school after MIT. So they are able to connect with, with current alumni who are doctors, and especially in this, in this current climate, it's great to have a, a better sense of what medical school is like and what life is really like in that type of career. So we're engaging in mentoring and community development both internally and externally. And then the last piece that we focus on is professional development resources. So all the members of the standard have access to a pool of funding that they can use for a variety of different things. So as Diana had mentioned uh, previously, we have a lot of uh, professionally focused groups such as SHIP, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, and all those organizations hold conferences each year. Um, those conferences uh, typically require a registration fee. Typically, they're not held in the Boston area, so there is airfare involved, hotel accommodations, and that can really add up to, to a large amount of money. So we have money that's set aside to help students attend those things. It can really offset the cost of those things. We also um, have money that's set aside to let students build skills outside of the classroom as well and pursue their own individual interests. So if a student um, is interested in taking a MOOC that has an enrollment fee, we can assist with that. And if a student, for example, I mentioned a technical or case interview, if they'd like a little bit of extra support around that, we've purchased technical uh, uh, based books, but not textbooks uh, for students in the past. And those students who are interested in grad school, 
as you can imagine, um, and probably have recently gone through if you've applied to more uh, to multiple schools as an undergrad, um, the exam costs, the application fees, the visit fees can all really add up. So for our students who are interested in pursuing graduate school, we also have money that's set aside to help students uh, offset the cost of standardized exams, such as the GRE, the LSAT, the GMAT. Um, and we can also help pay for application fees as well. So just as a quick overview, of the number of students who are in the program. So we currently have three active cohorts, um, juniors, sophomores, and first years. There's 56 members total. We tend to have between 15 and 20 uh, students who join each year. And I do have listed here as well, um, a range of the academic courses and interests that our, um, our students are participating in. So you see mechanical engineering, biology, um, more of those STEM focused majors. But I do also want to point out that if, if you're not necessarily interested in pursuing a STEM major at MIT, there is a place for you in the standard as well. We have students who are, who are participating in architecture and design, uh, political science, management and business analytics. So um, while a majority of our members are uh, STEM focused, not all of them are. And so we really encourage that also internal diversity of academic interests to participate as well. I would like to share one final testimonial here. So I initially decided to join the standard because I wanted to get more involved with the OME programs uh, on campus at MIT and to establish a, a network of peers and staff that I could reach out to. And in that respect, it's uh, definitely succeeded and I'm glad I did join. Um, as of right now, my favorite part of the program has probably been the retreat. Uh, it was really fun to go and uh, get acquainted with uh, all of the other members there and to sort of bond over a range of fun activities. Um, also, I will say one thing that I really like about the program uh, is that even though I've yet to personally experience it as a freshman, uh, it does seem like it really uh, evolves as you go through your time at, as you go through your time at MIT and really sort of shapes itself to meet the needs of the students participating in it. So those are my thoughts and well, what can I say? Glad I did it. So um, if all this sounds good to you and you're interested in, in joining uh, this wonderful program, um, the cohort four application will open in early August. There is that link there, the tinyurl.com slash standard cohort four. Um, that is the URL where the application will live and will go live in August. And if there are any questions specific to that program, you can definitely just email the standard at mit.edu. So with that, I will share, unshare my screen. And if there are any questions, happy to answer those. Let's see. So there have been some questions. One question was, so the standard is just for men. So I was able to answer that. Um, so the answer to that question is the standard is just for men. However, you may be wondering why we're only talking about a men of color program. And the answer to that is that we are co-sponsors on two other programs that are women of color, but they actually are generated by the Women's and uh, Gender Studies Office. And so they actually have the authority to, to talk about those in such a large scale way. But, but those, one of those is called My Sister's Keeper, which focuses on connecting women of color, primarily seeing the sound button come up. How's the sound now? Great. Um, so there are two programs, My Sister's Keeper, all um, women of color, primarily African-American women, but at all levels, undergrad, grad, faculty, and staff. And then um, Latinas, uh, Unidas, is that right? Um, Lilan, Hermanas Unidas. Hermanas Unidas. Hermanas Unidas, which just started um, is for women of color, of course, of Latin descent. And so we have those two programs that we partner with and we support, they just are not run out of the OME. I do see a question here about, are there support programs specific for non-binary people? Um, so I do know that LBGTQ plus services does a uh, whole different support groups, uh, peer groups uh, for those uh, students who do identify as non-binary. 
So one of the things that I think is great about MIT, although we do recognize the intersectionality of students and all of these office partner together. So like the OME partners with WGS, the OME partners with the Space Center, which houses the LGBTQ plus office um, and the Intercultural Center as well. So we all partner together to support students, but we also know students also have unique issues based on unique identities. And so those offices are established so that when students want to identify in a unique way with who they are, they can go to those resources directly for support. And as long as our offices are working together, we get to recognize the intersectionality of, of these identities that students have, and we support one another in that way. And all students have uh, like different identities that they want to emphasize while they're at MIT, and we try to support that. Uh, we will send out uh, to the emails that we sent to you, invite you to our session. We'll send out information on Hermanas um, Unidas so that you can actually um, get that uh, if you want to join that organization. I'm sure they would love to hear about that. So there's a few other questions in the chat. One of them is, do we partner with the Office of Engineering Outreach Programs? Um, we do, primarily through the work that we do with Interface Edge, but also in other ways. So I'll let uh, Samia talk about that when she talks about Interface Edge. I'm trying to see if I missed any other question. Okay. Any other questions regarding the standard or any of the programs that we talked about earlier? Okay. They're all on the edge of their seat, Samia, for Interface Edge. So I am going to share my screen. All right, could I get, uh, Diana, can I get a verbal confirmation that you can see my screen? Absolutely. Okay, awesome. All right, so my name is Samia Kalu. Um, I am one of the assistant deans in the Office of Minority Education, and I'm gonna be talking, uh, as Diana mentioned, about the Interface Edge program. So Interface Edge, this is a brief overview. Interface Edge uh, is a two-year scholar enrichment program that starts with a seven-week summer session um, that helps scholars learn about the rigors of MIT as well as build a strong community uh, that will that they will be able to carry with them into their first year here at the Institute. Uh, the seven week during the seven weeks scholars take four core classes. They take a physics, calculus, communications writing and chemistry class that's purpose is to one prepare them for their GIRs, but then also to prepare them just in general on how to approach academics at MIT learning in high school versus learning at MIT are two very different things. So how do you prepare for your classes? How do you prepare for exams? Approaching office hours, what are the best skills, tips, tricks on that? Uh, as well as sort of non-academic workshops that help to introduce scholars to the different resources and services uh, that they will be offered at the Institute. Going into their first academic year, uh, scholars are uh, asked to meet with their Interface Edge advisor on a bi-weekly basis. So their Interface Edge advisor is an OME staff member. Uh, these meetings are not very long. They're 15 minutes long. We know that our students are very busy during the academic year. Um, and the purpose is mainly to get the temperature of how your MIT experience is going up until that point. So are you taking the classes you want to take? Uh, do you have a good balance of extracurriculars and um, academics? Uh, do you feel like you're being uh, you're able to engage with the things that you want to engage with and are there any resources or support services that we can sort of help guide you towards. Going into the summer before the sophomore year, there is not very much programming. Um, that summer we want scholars to dedicate to really furthering their goals. So whether that's an internship, research opportunity, traveling abroad, um, and then coming back for a three-day retreat at the end of the summer. 
the retreat's purpose is to really bring students back to the Interface Edge community um, and also talk about, so now you're going into your sophomore year, uh, the second year for MIT students, they are going into their departments, they're going into their majors. So what skills might you need uh, now that you're in your major? What resources do your departments have to offer you? Um, and then also talking about uh, what resources the OME specifically can offer students uh, and the expectations of Interface Edge scholars in their sophomore year. Uh, so there is programming during the sophomore year. However, we meet with the students a little less regularly because we want them to focus on their departments uh, and, and we want them to sort of focusing on furthering their career within their departments. So those bi-weekly meetings that I talked about earlier turn into monthly meetings where we're continuing to check in um, and the workshops that we hold over the uh, second year also shift a bit to focus a little bit more on professional development. So resume critiques, how to prepare for an interview, um, how to write a uh, professional email. Uh, and then finally, at the end of their sophomore year, scholars uh, do graduate from the program. However, they are still uh, considered active participants uh, of Interface Edge. So we still have upperclassmen engaging with us either to come in and just chat if they need advice uh, or if they want to engage in a more official capacity uh, and be either a role model or a mentor for younger students or come back um, over the summer and teach for the Interface Edge uh, summer sessions. Um, once an Interface Edge Scholar, always an Interface Edge Scholar, our scholars continue to stay engaged pretty much throughout their MIT experience and also beyond. So I do have a student, um, a student testimonial that I would like to show you all. Hi, my name is Megan Davis. I'm a junior in Course 20, a part of the IP17 cohort. So I decided to apply to Interface Edge because I was really scared about starting MIT. I went to a like I start I went to two different high schools, but I didn't really feel like either had prepared me for all the rigor that MIT had promised me. And so and I also really felt like I needed access to like the different people and offices that were at MIT. I knew they existed, but I didn't really know that much about them um, and everything else. And so I started Interface and it ended up being like way more than I could have ever imagined. I made some of my best friends, even though like some of the people I was close to during Interface, I'm not still close to. My best friends are still from Interface. Um, they're just different Interfacers. Um, and having that community my freshman year was uh, unbelievably important to me. It allowed me to really expand my horizons knowing that I had a safe place uh, within my friends and within the OME to back me up and support me if I were to like fall or anything. Um, Interface also provided me with a lot of different connections to offices on campus which I found really helpful so I really used the time of time during Interface to explore, to ask questions, to establish my support network and my support system really early on which proved to be really really helpful so like S cubed, the office of the chancellor, um, the department of student life, all these people uh, I found really helpful and I found the relationships with the staff and the OME to be so important some of like my biggest mentors and advisors have been from the ome and i'm really really grateful to have been able to do interface thank you all right awesome uh so i also want to take some time to uh, talk about the program goals and key benefits um so an earlier transition into the rigors of MIT academics. So I talked about this a little bit before. Students are really, scholars over the summer really get to know MIT and what MIT is going to expect from them academically. And not just in their general institute requirements, but just throughout their career. Um, they get the opportunity to interact with faculty and key administrators. So students in, interact with faculty throughout the campus, uh, throughout the different departments, uh, as well as, as administrators from resources that they'll be using um, pretty much throughout their MIT career. Uh, a deeper personal relationship with an advisor, um, with their interface advisor and other scholars. Um, we work very hard throughout the summer to create programming that will really 
help them create that network, that foundation, uh, that, that trust that will guide them through their MIT career and sort of give them uh, an excellent support system throughout. Um, some of the benefits, going into the fall semester with a strong support system. So most students when starting college don't have 89 other friends that they can go to pretty much from day, day one. They don't have an office that they're already extremely comfortable with. Uh, so this is really truly a launching pad. Um, Interface Edge Summer is cost free. Uh, so any, any costs that are associated with the program aside from airfare are covered by the program. Scholars are not expected to cover those costs. Uh, and the program is uh, selective, not conditional. So uh, you were admitted into MIT, which means you do not need this program to thrive at MIT. Interface Edge is intended for students who really want a launching pad to help them exceed expectations throughout their MIT, or to MIT career, excuse me. Uh, students who want an edge on their MIT experience and students who want a community that they can not only gain from but also give back to. Uh, so this is a question that I have been asked several times up until this point, so I want to give a quick overview on this. Uh, so due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Interface Edge program uh, will be shifting to a virtual platform. Um, so MIT has not made a final decision on sort of when it will be safe for students to come back to campus in the case that it is decided that it will be safe for students to come in July or August we will work with our campus partners to try and get the cohort to campus um, but we don't have an official update on that yet uh, another thing that Dianetta mentioned previously um, so some of you may have read on our website this summer our plan was to launch Interface Edge X which was the cohort of 20 students online in addition to the 70 students on campus uh, because we are completely virtual, uh, we are now shifting to uh, having a virtual cohort of 90 students who are essentially having the exact same experience. Um, all the programming that we offer to the students will be exactly the same. Uh, this summer, we will also be having a parent and guardian orientation session in the welcome week for the Interface Edge program. Um, we recognize that this is sort of, this is a new, this is a new thing that we're tackling. Um, this is the first time that we have students going through the Interphase Edge summer, but also parents going through it. So really telling parents what the expectations that we have of their scholars are, what are the time commitments, and how can parents and guardians really help to make it so that their scholar is getting the most out of the, the Interphase Edge experience, uh, so that they are really ready for their fall semester. Uh, and then on the other end of it, helping scholars navigate how to be a college student at home. So how do you find your space at home, your study spaces? Uh, do you have the technology that you need at home to be a, a college student? Um, and also, how do you navigate the relationships that you're building virtually? So you're talking to your professors, your TAs, administrators um, online now. So how do you really build those strong, uh, long lasting relationships? All academics will be run through the MITx platform this summer. Um, that is essentially uh, MIT's version of edX. Some of you may have sort of had yeah, gotten the chance to interact with it already. Um, MITx, it's wonderful that we're able to use it over the summer. Um, it's also a platform that MIT uses pretty regularly throughout the academic year. Uh, so scholars are sort of getting an insight into something that they will be using uh, once they enroll in the fall. And then finally, the strong community and support system. So the academics are so important, but the strong community and support system that scholars build um, with, through this program is crucial and it really helps guide them through their MIT experience. Uh, and we, I want to ensure you and we want to ensure you that that is still a, a huge part of our mission and vision and sort of a huge part of what we're building into this virtual programming that we're doing this summer. Uh, going into the fall semester this year is more daunting for uh, students or could be more daunting for students because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we want to really reassure students uh, that by the end of the summer and throughout the summer, we'll be building trust and relationships. And no matter what MIT, the country, uh, the world, this pandemic throws at you, you are not going through it alone and you will thrive through it because you have this very strong support system. Uh, I have another testimonial that I would like to share with you. Oops, sorry about that. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Asia Hipsher. I'm a current junior studying course 10, chemical engineering. And I remember when I got into MIT, I was so surprised. I was thinking, how am I going to go from my high school to MIT? And I knew that would be a big step. And I really wanted to bridge that gap. And that was one of the main reasons I applied to Interface. And honestly, that made all the difference. Um, but in addition to that, one of the biggest lessons I had to learn during Interface was how to ask for help. Um, you know, coming from high school, or I was kind of able to just do it all on my own and going to MIT, but that was definitely not the case. Interface really helped me by giving me a community of people I knew I could work with. Um, it gave me the opportunity to get on campus and familiarize myself with the resources available. And going into my freshman year, that was definitely um, something that I needed. And just knowing who I could go to for help has made all the difference for my freshman year and honestly has given me a support system that I still rely on to this day. So Interface definitely made all the difference for um, my MIT experience. All right, so I, I do want to spend some time talking about the application. So uh, many of you have already, or many students have already started uh, working on their application. Uh, and so how to build a strong application. So we want to, in the short answer essay questions that we ask, we want to really get to know you as a person. Uh, so what are your strengths, areas of growth? What uh, communities have you been a part of and contributed to? What are uh, potential sort of things you're concerned about about coming to MIT? Uh, things that you're excited about about coming to MIT and participating in the Interface Edge program? Uh, we want to see a genuine interest in the program goal. So knowing that students have done their research, that they've gone online and really looked into what the Interface Edge program does, what the mission and vision of the program are. Um, talking about the two-year experience, not just the summer experience. So there are two whole years of Interface Edge um, that we sort of construct to really help scholars thrive through their MIT experience. Um, so what do you know about that and sort of what aspects of that are you excited to engage in? Uh, and what will you add to the program? So community is wonderful and you can get a lot from it, but what do you feel like you can give back to the Interface Edge community? Um, and then finally, a strong uh, letter of recommendation uh, that is non-academic. So we want to hear from your recommender how they know you. So, and sort of not just, we, you've been admitted into MIT, we know you have stellar academics. Um, so we wanna hear about sort of you as a person, not you as a student. Um, this does not mean that it cannot be a teacher. It just needs to be someone, if it is a teacher, it just needs to be a teacher that knows you out of the class and out of the academic environment. So students who are admitted into the Interface Edge program, we do have some, expectations of those scholars throughout the two years. Uh, so participating in the entirety of the summer and academic year portions, uh, this is mainly us asking you to engage, asking you to participate, attend the workshops, and get the most out of the program that you possibly can. Uh, being an ambassador for the program, so we have several students in their first year, second year, junior year, senior year, um, take on mentorship roles for younger students um, generally, when CPW happens on campus, we have a student panel who's ready and willing to talk about their, and excited to talk about their interface edge experience. Uh, we have students participate in, as um, coming back, a way to participate is also to come back through the summer and help teach the classes that are taught um, in the summer portion. Uh, meeting with your OME advisor, so those uh, bi-weekly and monthly meetings, attending those regularly and making sure that you're engaging in a way um, that uh, makes it so that we get to know you, your needs, and how we can best support you throughout your experience. Uh, balance of co-curriculars and acti co -curricular activities and academics. Now, this one's extremely important. Uh, MIT has so much to offer its students, and sometimes it's easy to try and do everything at once. Uh, so we, and what we expect from our scholars is to really uh, think about their semester and think about what can I do now? What can I do to make my semester, my year, my MIT experience challenging, but not overwhelming um, and still getting the most out of it. Uh, attendance in the sophomore retreat, so the retreat that I talked about earlier in the session, that is mandatory for scholars to attend. 
And then finally, to sort of wrap this all up, commitment and communication. Uh, so we want scholars to engage. We create a program that we think the way it's designed is going to really help you build community, help you build um, confidence, and really set you up for success uh, throughout your MIT career and also beyond. So really being an active participant in that. And then finally, uh, here are some key dates uh, for the program. So applications should be completed and submitted by April 27th at 12 p.m. Uh, program decisions will be sent out on May 11th, and students who have been admitted into the program uh, need to let us know about their intentions by May 15th. The program itself will be held from June 22nd to August 15th, and as a reminder that June 22nd start is virtual, um, and uh, sort of deciding whether or not students uh, are going to be able to come onto campus at any point in this time uh, will happen once MIT makes its final decision. Uh, so I am going to stop sharing my screen now. And, oh. So Samia, as you yes. recalibrate over there, I'm going to start posing some of the questions that have popped up in the chat, some of which I've been able to answer. Some I think are so great that we need to address them with the larger group. Um, so to save us time, so the ones that I have answered, I'll give you the answer. If you want to expound upon it, you can. Um, so one question, I'm going to the start of the questions. Uh, so I'm working from some of the first questions we got up to the most recent questions that came in right toward the end of the segment. So the first question was how many students apply to the program and how many get admitted? My answer was that um, the applications vary from year to year, but generally we get anywhere between 140 and 150 applications for 70 slots. And as you just shared, this year was the first year we were going to increase the number of students accepted to 90 students. Mm -hmm. and Yes, absolutely. So that that is 100% the answer. We have seen a slight spike in applications this year, but um, not by very much more than the numbers you described. So the next question is, um, hold on. There was a question about applying to Interphase and Stephen Kemble was gracious enough to add the link for Interphase Edge application. Um, and um, I think that you also shared information on the screen for that, but should you just talk a little bit about the application process and sharing that very quickly? Absolutely. So in order to apply to Interphase, you do uh, need to create an account on the OME website. So if you go to the OME website um, and you go to the Interphase Edge landing page, it'll take you, there is a link to create an account. Um, once we get that information, we create an account for you um, and you get access to the Interphase Edge application itself. Um, which is essentially a few short answer questions, some personal, we ask for some personal information. There is a letter of recommendation um, that needs to be non-academic. Um, the application itself is due on April 27th at 12 p.m. Um, are there any other questions about the application specifically? Can I share that with you? Um, so for, for some reason, one of the students is saying that they haven't been able to get an OME account despite signing up multiple times, and they ask, can we address that? Yes, absolutely. So in the case that um, we have had some instances where if students are requesting at the same time or if there's a glitch in the system when you request, we don't receive the notification. If you're noticing that you're not hearing back, I recommend please uh, email interphase at mit.edu and we'll be able to create an application for you. There was a question about um, in selecting applicants what we are looking for. I do think that you covered that um, in the application, but is there any points that you want to hit home for, so that they can take that with them as uh, key things to watch out for? Absolutely. So uh, we want, so what we want is to see in the application uh, sort of a description of you, a non-academic description of you. So who are you as a person? What are your strengths, areas of growth? Um, how, why are you excited about this community and how do you feel like you can contribute to this community? Uh, we are looking for students who want to engage not just for the summer, but also the entirety of the two academic years who really want to sort of get that launching pad and then also give back and be a mentor to students, be an ambassador for this program. And who, are, who really value community um, and growth within a community. 
So there are a couple of questions related to cost and um, uh, benefits. So one of the questions was, does cost-free include the plane ticket? You said uh, it covers everything except airfare. Um, in the chat, I shared that again. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize there was if students do have a problem with airfare, that's again, if we actually get to be on campus for any portion of the program, they shouldn't let that be a barrier. They should just reach out to the OME, reach out to you to let, let us know that so that we can assist. The other thing was about students being able to store their things in between uh, the program ending and then starting the first year. And you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so there is no need to worry about storage if we are able to come on campus. Um, we actually arrange, we work with housing to arrange that scholars are able to actually move directly into their fall dorms as soon as the program ends. Uh, so you're essentially moving in and then if you'd like to go home for that span of time, you can, you're sort of, you're moved in and, and you're able to do, you have the flexibility to do whatever you'd like after that. So storage is not um, an, an issue. Um, one question had to do with the elimination of the student summer contribution. If you are an interface as scholar, they wanted to know if that still applied given that the program is virtual. Um, an, an adjacent question to that is um, if we are able to come on campus and we've selected 90 students, will all 90 of those students be able to come on campus? So those are excellent questions. Um, so for the student contribution, we have reached out to Student Financial Services. They are still working on navigating what they're doing with the MIT in general is working on navigating what they're doing with the student contribution this summer. Um, so, oh, I just saw an application being created. Thank you to whoever that was. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so we do not have an answer to that yet. However, once we do get a, a definitive answer from MIT and from Student Financial Services, uh, we we will definitely be posting that on our website. Um, sorry, Dianetta, what was the second question? If we are able to spend any portion of the program on campus in the summer, will all 90 students be able to come on campus? So that is an excellent question. My hope, our hope is yes. Um, we would like all students to be able to sort of, you're starting on the same, in the same place, we would like you all to continue together. Um, that will be up to housing, that will be up to MIT in general. Unfortunately, I, I wish I had a more definitive answer right now. Um, again, once we know more about uh, if and when students are able to come back to campus, I will be able to, to give more information on that. And again, any, any information that we get, we will then post uh, on the MIT website. Um, because there was, a, originally there was going to be sort of a distinction, interphase students who were on campus and then interphase X students who were joining our interphase on campus cohort. But whatever goes for it now, every student is going to be virtual. So uh, for some portion of the program, and so one question uh, to, to clarify was, uh, do all of the benefits that Interphase Edge Scholars get apply to Interphase Edge X Scholars? And for us, they're exactly the same student. It's just how long they spend on campus. So if there's a benefit to the on-campus students, if there was a distinction, the Interphase Edge X students would get the same benefit. Yes. Any other questions? Oh yeah, they're plenty. Hold tight. <laughs> Um, let's see. Find it down. I'm trying to see if there's anything that um, that you haven't answered. So I see one about how flexible uh, interface edge. So I, I want to uh, make something clear. I said this a little bit in um, my presentation. So there isn't really a distinction between interface and interface edge X this summer. All scholars are sort of participating in the same um, in the same program. So it, it's not that Interphase at Scholars is uh, less flexible and Interphase Edge X Scholars have a more flexible summer. Um, the way we're deci designing this uh, program over the summer uh, for all 90 scholars is sort of keeping in mind that you are at home. So there is a level of flexibility that we want to give you and there is a level of respect that we're trying to sort of uh, give to you and your families. We know you're at home. We know you have um, sort of other things that you will be doing. So there are synchronous and asynchronous aspects of the of the program. Uh, we're also very cognizant of the fact that we have people from many, many different time zones. Um, so sort of the timing of the synchronous uh, activities is, is very intentional. We make it so that it will be convenient for people uh, no matter where they are in the country. 
so will interface still have all four courses and will all students be taking four courses yes every single student will be taking four courses this summer um so there's a question about uh timing and graduation um so for instance one student said they're not graduation was scheduled for them you know june 23rd when school session ends the 27th not sure how that has changed it changed mm -hmm. um and how many hours per day for interphase um so the how many hours per i'm gonna do that one last um so regardless of when your graduation is regardless of when uh your senior year is ending we still highly encourage that you apply um, and then each uh, applicant will be sort of will discuss on a case by case basis how to navigate um, participating in the program if, if you are admitted and you decide you would like to enroll. Um, in regards to how many hours per day, uh, that really depends on. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it varies from subject to subject. Um, we like to say that um, it, so there is there are lecture videos that students are going to have to watch this summer. Um, there is some level of synchronous um, activity. Uh, we are trying to make it so that the interface edge program is not like a job. We don't want it to be 40 hours a week. Um, it'll probably be closer to uh, 25, 30 hours a week. Um, uh, in order for, and that is including lectures, that is including office hours, um, problem set groups, that's including the activities, the non-active academic activities, uh, and sort of the community building activities that we have. So um, there are two questions uh, related to sports and athletes. Do many fall sport athletes participate in this program? How is the balance between commitment to interface along with the commitment to a varsity sport? Um, a similar question is, do certain varsity sports commitments conflict with some of the requirements for interface? So yes, we do have several athletes. Um, and one thing that we try to do when making the schedule for the academic year is be very cognizant of the schedule um, of students who are uh, participating in varsity sports. So generally varsity sports happen, so the practices happen between um, 5 and 7 p.m. So we try to um, have at some activities, any mandatory activities, we try to engage um, with students after 7 p.m. There are some activities from 5 to 6 p.m. during the academic year, um, but we, we are extremely flexible with students who are participating in athletic activities, and it's sort of handled, that's also sort of handled on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but I guess the short answer is yes, we have several varsity athletes. So in a traditional interface model, um, a question about whether you could take other classes while you're taking interphase is usually no. So this is a question now, is it possible to balance interphase with other programs that have classes during the summer too? So my answer to that is I recommend no. Um, you are not just taking classes over the summer. Um, you are we expect that our scholars participate in a holistic way. You are building a community, you're building relationships, you're building trust, you're learning about MIT far beyond just the academics that it has to offer you and you're gaining skills um, far beyond just this is how you study. Um, so doing that while also taking an additional class that's outside of interface, I highly recommend not doing that because you will not get the, the, the complete experience. You will not get everything out of the um, interface experience if you are divided between interface classes and other classes that are outside of it. Are there any word limits on the short answer questions? Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I, no, technically no, um, but uh, I wouldn't go over a, a page single spaced. Do you think we can get a job while participating in interface? Um, so this is also going to be on a case by case basis. We recognize and understand that there are students who uh, may need to work throughout the summer. Um, and we will do our best to accommodate for that and make sure that students are getting the most out of their interface edge experience. Um, I will say that fully engaging in this program and sort of having the ability to focus solely on this program, there is a benefit to that, but we will work with students uh, depending on, on sort of what their lives are like at home. So um, another question has to do with, um, will other support groups conflict with EDGE or the standard, like other activities and events? And so, um, 
you can attempt to answer that and then we can talk about it more generally if you'd like. So when it comes specifically to OME programs, we, uh, the staff sort of works together to try and not conflict. Uh, we have meetings that, uh, where we go over our individual calendars and we try to not conflict with programming um, and also not like what we're, give, what we're offering to the students and also when we're offering it to them. For example, there are several times where uh, Devin and I would like to do similar uh, workshops for either our first or second year students. Um, and in those cases, we generally tend to collaborate. Uh, so it's not an overlap, it's just, and, it's, and we try our best to be, not to make it inconvenient for the students. Uh, in the case that there is an overlap, we sort of work that out among uh, sort of the assistant deans or the people who are running the programs. Um, and at no point is a student penalized for needing to attend one thing over another if, they are, if they're happening at the same time. Devin, would you add anything? Nope, that's exactly, exactly right. Awesome, and Leland, would you add anything? So um, a couple of uh, other questions uh, that are sort of general in nature. Um, so are the classes and interface similar to those offered through MIT OCW or are they unique? And it could be like MIT X as well. So you can address that one. So they are unique. They are not, um, they are not at all. Uh, we, we do not take any classes uh, directly from OCW or MIT X. Uh, we sort of, our, my academic staff has designed a curriculum that is specifically um, uh, specifically meant to really help create a launching pad for students. Um, there are some classes uh, at MIT that, that roughly do that, but because of the engagement that we have with students over the summer, because it's not just sort of content online, um, we're also able to sort of shift and move in directions depending on what our scholars need throughout the summer. There are also, so one thing that I, I should have mentioned earlier, each subject has three sections within it. Um, so they, for calculus, chemistry, and physics, there are three different sections or three different levels of those classes that are offered throughout the summer. Uh, we know that there are some students who are coming in with more knowledge in certain subjects uh, versus other subjects. Scholars take a knowledge-based assessment for all three of those classes um, at the beginning of the summer, and that knowledge-based assessment sort of decides what section uh, they're going to be in in order for us to make sure that we are supporting them and sort of sending them off into their uh, first year with, with a really strong foundation. So um, a couple of questions that are quick to answer. Can a letter of recommendation be from a peer? No. So, and also um, it says that the, the recommender should know you about two years and uh, some, basically this person is uh, saying that they don't necessarily have access to those advisors because they may have left their school. So would one year be fine? Yes, one year would be fine. As long as they know you on a deep personal level and can really talk about you as a person um, and sort of how you've engaged with your community or activities, uh, they would be a good recommender. By the way, everyone, these are great questions. You're asking all wonderful questions. Will the online classes prepare you to place out of those courses via the ASEs? Uh, so that is not the goal. Um, we have many students uh, who end the summer and choose to ASE and do ASE out of their classes, but the goal is not to give uh, scholars the, the the content that they need in order to take the ASE exam. Interface is not ASE prep. We are preparing you for MIT and MIT classes. However, we should say that we have a high success rate of students who take them and pass them, right? We do. Yeah. It's, it's, it, that's not how the summer is uh, designed, but it does happen. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have, a, we have about five more minutes. Um, we can stay a little bit longer if people want to linger, but we definitely want to give uh, people the, the freedom to sign off at 4.30 because the session is uh, supposed to officially end at 4.30. And we want to thank you for sharing this time with us. Um, but let's try to get in a few additional questions. Um, if you've taken some courses involved with interface, like the calculus course or the physics course through some AP classes, would it be beneficial to apply? This question came earlier for, from another student as well. So that's uh, twice I've seen that question. So could you try to address that one? 
Yes, because so if you take in calculus APs, if you take in classes in high school, uh, that does not, uh, classes in high school are not necessarily, I mean, it depends on the high school, but not necessarily going to prepare you for how to study at MIT. Um, again, the, the, the main goal of the classes is to teach you how to learn at MIT. What kind of a student do you need to be at MIT in order to thrive here? Uh, so although maybe some of the concepts may be things that you have seen before, the strategies that we are giving you throughout the summer will be very different. So we still highly encourage that you apply. So um, one of the questions is, uh, what are the course offerings for Interface, just to be more specific, um, now that it's completely online, just to, to spell those out once again. And um, I guess this is someone who may have known uh, a little bit more about Interface because they're asking if we anticipate offering other classes in the future now that we can do a portion of this program online. Um, so the classes that are offered are calculus, physics, uh, chemistry, and communications writing. Um, in regards to uh, our, if we would consider af offering more classes, I think that right now we are truly focused on this summer, and those are the only four classes that we are offering this summer. Um, but now that this is something that we can do, and MITx is a resource that we can that we do have, um, there is a chance that we will look into offering different classes. Uh, if the question is specific to this summer, no, those are the only four classes. So two quick questions. Um, the, the PowerPoint presentation and the recording will become available um, for folks to have later. So we will place that either on the OME website and or on our CPW page. So we will make that available. Um, I'll take this one last question and then give people a chance to log off if they really need to do so. And then we'll stay on just a little bit later, um, longer to answer some of the additional questions if people want to stay. So this last question has to do with, is the interface program meant only for students from minority backgrounds? Um, oh, Dianetta, were you about to answer that? Sorry. Um, yes, I can. Oh, okay, I can. <laughs> um, I can. So, so the, the, the program itself and the Office of Minority Education clearly is, is designed to support the success of minority students. However, every single program that the OME runs is open and available to all students who apply. So for instance, Interphase, the only students who are not eligible for Interphase right now are international students. Um, all domestic students are eligible to apply if they've been, um, if they've been admitted to MIT. So there is no restriction on non-minority students participating. The programs themselves and the office themselves itself was created to support the success of minority students and those who also might be from underrepresented populations or marginalized populations or anyone who loves what we do and wants to be a part of it. Um, in regards to the question about the swim test, that is solely dependent on whether or not we will be able to um, uh, get, come on campus uh, this summer. Uh, we are still working with uh, MIT's physical education team. Uh, we are trying to see if there is something uh, PE related that we will be able to do uh, on camp uh, for the virtual uh, programming because generally when students are on campus they do take a PE class uh, which then they uh, get two units of credit for so if we're able to do something like that over the summer we will the swim test itself if we're able to come on campus uh, the PE department Daper they are willing to host us and willing to do the swim test um, it's just sort of dependent on the pandemic and sort of uh, safety of the for the students so it is now 4.30 and we uh, want to, you know, thank everyone for participating in the information session. And I want to let everyone know that we are available at OMEMIT at MIT.edu. So you can email us additional questions. You can email the interface um, email address if you have specific questions to interface. But we want to, to see you here in the fall, whether that's in a virtual capacity or an on-campus capacity, and continue to reach out to us if you have additional questions. And as I said, we'll stay online uh, to make sure that if we can answer a few other questions, we can do that. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, in regards to the question that just came on about uh, labs and professors, so yes, 
Uh, we are going to be finding ways to virtually introduce students to the labs on campus uh, and have them interact with faculty and staff uh, at MIT. It's going to be structured a little differently because uh, we can't do lab tours anymore uh, in the uh, literal sense, but it will definitely happen. Um, how is Interphase different from MITES? So Interphase, uh, I, I, so Interphase has a focus on really preparing students for their college experience, um, whereas MITES is more of like an introduction into that world. Um, so we are building a community that scholars are going to continue to use throughout their academic year. We're introducing them to the MITES program doesn't necessarily learn about the resources on this campus um, because they won't uh their juniors they're they're rising juniors in high school so they're not that is not a focus of that program um oh and one thing that uh, somebody asked how do we engage with oeop generally over the summer we have a mites interface edge athletic challenge um this year we are working with uh most tech which is also a program that is run with the oeop uh to see if we can engage with those students in some way um, I don't know if Jessica is still on, but uh, she asked a question about is there a distinction uh, between Interphase and Interphase Edge X, given that we're now all going to be virtual? No, there is not. It is all the same. <laughs> it is one big program this summer. Okay, we have some new questions. Uh, somebody did read on the website that the limit for the essay questions is 800 words. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, we do have some students who are submitting because the 800 words they feel like they're not able to say everything we do have some students who are submitting uh, supplemental documents uh, we do accept those as well is there any way for students to take less than the four classes over the summer such as what was originally offered through edge x uh, unfortunately right now no we are sort of planning for the summer to be um, the same for all scholars So uh, actually, this question was asked before. Your Kerberos is something that you design. It's something that you allocate. You don't get your Kerberos. Um, eventually, MIT, once you are enrolled in MIT, you'll get an email that sort of tells you how to set up your Kerberos. Uh, I know that that's something that's asked in the creating of the um, Interface Edge application. So it's basically whatever you would like your username at MIT.edu to be. I can't, I think. Will the supplemental documents be given less weight than the short answer prompts? No. And sorry, to be clear, so students have asked if they could give, uh, provide supplemental documents and been approved for it. Um, adding supplemental documents uh, with to the application itself is not possible you actually have to email them to us um, so you have to be approved to uh, submit a supplemental document i think this uh this student um has has logged off but um i do want us to make sure we talk about it some graduations have been pushed back as far back as august 1st and so um there's a possibility they may be able to have some semblance of a graduation celebration and so if they are in interphase that could impact uh, the timing for them so somebody's asking what would a supplemental document include speaking of supplemental documents um it's just so because there is a word limit um it's just if you feel like there was information that you wanted to put in your essay that you weren't able to put in your essay those supplemental documents are generally very short it's a paragraph um, that you feel like you weren't able to say enough in the short answers or you feel like there's something that the short answers didn't ask that you would like to share with the OME and interface team. Does participating in most tech um, negatively impact someone in some way for getting accepted into interface? No. It's something that we see and know um, when we're looking at their application, but it, it doesn't really uh, decide whether or not they would get in. 
Um, this is a great question, um, Jorge. Uh, can we discuss financial questions with the OME team or should that be reserved for the financial office? I think at this point, because the financial letters are just coming out, you really do need to talk to the student financial services officers because they will know specifically what the, what the guidelines are and what the laws are and what they can and cannot do as it relates to financial aid. And the truth is, if you ask us, we're just going to go and ask them. Oh, uh, can they talk about extracurricular activities in their short answer prompts? Absolutely. Okay, I mean, I... So I will say one thing. So any questions that aren't answered or if you think of questions specific to the Interphase Edge program, um, after we log off, uh, you can just email interface at mit.edu and we'd be happy to answer questions then as well. Who is the program targeted to? Is that Interphase Edge? I, I think so. It, it literally says what I, yeah, I think it's an Interphase Edge question. Um, so interface edge, I mean, so we, the OME serves uh, the underrepresented population um, at MIT uh, interface edge in our recruitment of students, we, we do the same, um, but we admit, we accept applications from and admit scholars um, from pretty much, again, Diana already said this, but the only restriction is one, you have to be enrolled in MIT, uh, and also we are unable to accept uh, international students at this time. And if you really want to sort of get the sort of the, the the history of Interphase was that it was created at a time when MIT was just beginning to get a critical mass of minority students, and uh, that group, though we have grown tremendously in terms of the number of minority students who are on campus, almost twenty five percent of the undergraduate population is minority. Um, it's still a minority population on our campus, which is why we still focus on that group. Um, but that is the only reason why um, it is focused on minority students, just to ensure that they get the support um, that could be helpful and beneficial to them to navigate MIT. Many students could navigate MIT without interface. It is not necessarily a requirement, which is why any student can apply. Um, and so, but what it does do, because students tell us this 100% of the time, it helps them understand what it takes for them to be successful at MIT. And that is something that every student has said after they have been through Interphase. And so they get exposure to courses, they get exposure to faculty and staff and students, they build communities, they learn how to study for MIT. Even if they were excellent students, which all of them are, they still need to figure out the MIT way for them. And that's what Interphase does. So any student who wants that should apply to Interphase. Um, in regards to the application, um, I wouldn't say avoiding uh, topics that you said you discussed in your MIT application. Um, I The question is, should I avoid topics in my interface application that I put in my MIT application? If you feel like it's relevant to the prompts that we're giving you, then absolutely put it. Go into more depth. We do have access to your MIT application, so we, we do. There are certain portions of that that we do look at. Um, so I wouldn't do a copy paste, um, but if you would like to add, talk about uh, topics uh, that you discuss in your MIT application. That is totally fine. Um, for how long should the recommender know the applicant? Uh, we say two years because we want someone who has built a strong relationship with you. However, if you have someone who you've known for one year, who, who knows you very well outside of the academic context, um, that is fine as well. So it seems like we're at the end of our questions and we've caught up. Oh, just when I said that. Let's see. No, nope. it's just a thank, thank you. you. Yeah. All thank <laughs> so thank you all um, for staying with us for the after party of the interface information <laughs> session. Um, and if you have further questions, just email us and let us know. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend and welcome to MIT. Thank you very much. Of course. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.